Today, housing markets are hurting. The DFA Daily is 23rd of May 2020. Hello again, I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the latest posts covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today we look at the latest developments in the property sector, both here and in the US. And as you will see, property is so cheap over there compared to Australia, yet even in the United States, things are not that good. And before I start, a quick reminder that on Tuesday, the 26th of May at 8pm Sydney time, I'll be joined by Edwin Almeida, our Property Insider, for a live stream event where you can ask us questions in real time via the YouTube chat or beforehand via the DFA blog. And of course, the focus will be finance and property. I look forward to seeing you there. But first, the ABC reported again on interest-only loans. Westpac, they say, now has confirmed borrowers can apply to extend the interest-only period on their loans for up to a year instead of being forced to start paying the principal of their loans when it expires. This includes allowing interest-only customers to extend their loan term for up to 12 months or customers on principal and interest repayments to switch to interest-only repayments for the same period. We recognise that COVID-19 has had a significant impact on household finances and these changes will provide affected customers with more flexibility with their home loan repayments during this time, Westpac said. For Adelaide couple Diane and Brian O'Shane, whose loans are with different banks, Westpac's statement offered little hope. The self-funded retirees were already struggling with their loan repayments before the virus hit and now their tenants on the Gold Coast have had to break their lease due to the pandemic. Ms McShane, a former administrative assistant and her husband, an ex-electrician, started investing in property 20 years ago to try to fund their retirement. They currently have three investment properties, two in Queensland and one in Western Australia. But instead of earning an income from them, the couple in their 60s are paying $9,000 a month to the bank to cover their loans, which switched from interest only to principal interest last year. Mr McShane said that the couple were running out of funds and would ultimately be forced to sell into the falling market. There will come a day when we're going to run out of money because we're paying all this principal and we'll have to sell everything and we'll have nothing left, he said. The couple said that they asked their bank 12 months ago if they could retain their interest-only term but their application was rejected because they were no longer in the workforce. And they said the bank rang them earlier this week to indicate that they could apply for a new loan, but the pair had little confidence that it will be approved. Sydney investor Mike Scotland, a former school teacher, owes $1.1 million to the banks and is in a similar predicament. Mr Scotland has six investment properties and all the loans have switched to principal and interest. The rationale was that there is no way to gain wealth in Australia unless you invent a better mousetrap, win the lottery, have a brilliant business, or maybe you do a bit of investment, he said. Mr Scotland said all of his properties had either fallen in value or flatlined, while rents had also dropped, and he envisaged that he would have to sell in eight or nine months' time at a loss. So I'm heading towards a deadline, I'm heading towards a cliff, he said. And Westpac's policy is in line with recent advice from the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, ASIC, that the banks could extend interest-only terms during the COVID-19 pandemic and it would not trigger responsible lending obligations. And Chief Economist at REA Group, Nerida Cosenby, said property investors would be most affected by the COVID downturn because of the impact on the rental markets from job losses. But she said it was in the bank's interest to support their customers through the difficult times. I can't see it happening that the banks would allow wholesale defaults of loans or wholesale distress in the property market by forcing people to sell to pay back debt, she said. Ms Consby said crunch time for the housing market would come when borrowers, including investors, reach the end of the leniency period 
for mortgage deferrals the banks had introduced. The big concern now is what happens after that six months, she said. And banking analyst Brett Lemessurier said the banks had already offered considerable relief to mortgagees, granting relief from paying interest. It is not like they are taking a hard approach to their customers, he said. They are actually taking the most sympathetic approach they have ever taken. But of course, there are obviously examples when customers are not getting the sort of relief from the major banks that others are. The danger for the banks granting a lot of relief to people is that you are just creating more problems for the future. And NAB issued a statement saying it had a team contacting customers approaching the end of their interest only terms to work with them on the right solution, which can include restructuring a loan if required. This included a fast-tracked process for customers with interest-only loans due to expire in the next six months to extend their interest-only period for a year. But this would not apply to borrowers who had reached their maximum interest-only term. And ANZ did not respond to the question of extending interest-only loan periods, but said customers could request a repayment deferral on their home loan for up to six months. And this did include investor paying interest only. And the bank said 105,000 home loan customers had sought assistance. Now, Senator Dean Smith said he welcomed the prospect of more flexibility by the banks, providing the application process for borrowers was not onerous and requests for extensions were actually granted. It's encouraging to see one of Australia's major lending institutions changed its policy towards the extension of interest-only loans, but these changes now need to be made industry-wide, he said. I again call on the entire Australian banking and finance sector to extend interest-only loan repayments until the pandemic's financial fallout has passed. And the calls for government support for the housing sector continue apace. While the mortgage-broking industry has weathered a steady stream of challenges from the global financial crisis to APRA's tightening regulation around interest-only and investor loans to the Royal Commission, Connective Executive Director Mark Harron highlighted the unique obstacle presented by COVID-19 and the support needed to continue doing best by borrowers. The COVID-19 environment is going to have a very significant impact on a lot of new customers in terms of their employment, he said. While there's been a bit of a reprieve in that people have access to government funding and they're able to pause their repayments, we are moving towards the end of the six month repayment pause period, still having a lot of people not in a financial position to make those repayments. There will be jobs people had coming into this COVID-19 pandemic that just won't be there going forward. And that's gonna put a lot more stress on the system for a lot longer until we see more significant economic uptick, which we won't really see until the last quarter of 2021 financial year, April to June next year. Brokers need to work with their clients and the banks to adjust to that massive challenge. Given the grave figures around COVID-19 job losses and the long-term implications they carry, Harron expects to see further support offered to home loan customers, whether through an extension of the loan repayment pause or the introduction of other measures. We're seeing a really responsible approach from the banks to date. So if there are still going to be 700,000 to 1 million people that don't have income in September and October, the banks are not going to be in a hurry to do foreclosures on any of those people, he explained. Certainly, the banks won't want to be putting a lot of houses on the market because it would have a disastrous effect on property values as well, which would not be to anyone's benefit, especially the banks holding on to those mortgages. However, the Connective Director stressed that the ongoing support for the economy can't rest solely on the banks but needs to extend to government as well. The key comes from the government supporting 
the bank's measures and supporting brokers in regards to any after complaints that might flow from the fact that banks are doing the right thing by their customers and allowing them to put a repayment pause, he said. Should a customer then turn around and complain to an ombudsman that it has caused them significant financial cost, well, the alternative was that the bank didn't give that option and move the customer into foreclosure sooner, which really wouldn't have been humane. We're just hoping for a good, balanced approach, not only from banks and government, but also from the regulators, Harren concluded. Yet, the REA is talking the market up. Well, I suppose there's no surprise there. Forecasts saying that house prices will drop up to 30% are highly questionable, according to the Real Estate Institute of Australian President Adrian Kennedy. We are in unprecedented times, and anyone that suggests that they can forecast with any acceptable degree of probability is being highly fanciful, said Mr Kelly. We can only look at what is happening in the marketplace at the moment, as well as in previous times of high unemployment, to provide pointers to likely outcomes. Currently, we have a situation where listings are decreasing, yet the inquiry level from prospective buyers is increasing. It's a simple economic it's simple economics that when supply decreases and demand remains, then prices edge upwards. They certainly don't drop. Mr. Kelly said that recent forecasts suggest that the supply of new housing will be severely constrained over the coming year. The Housing Industry Association is expecting buildings of new dwellings to fall by almost 50% over the rest of 2020 and into 21, said Mr. Kelly. This does not suggest a scenario of supply exceeding demand, a prerequisite for falling prices. Whilst it is expected that higher levels of unemployment will provide a constraint on home prices, the anticipated levels of around 10% have been experienced before, and we should look at what happened to housing prices then. History shows us that in the early 1990s we had a sustained period of unemployment above 10%, yet median house prices remained stable, said Mr Kelly. It also needs to be remembered that in the recession we had to have interest rates for housing loans were around double what they currently are. I do not believe that this points to a catastrophic outlook for house prices, concluded Mr Kelly. Well, to that I make three points. First, interest rates may be lower now, but the average mortgage is a whole lot bigger. Secondly, the quantum and change in unemployment is much faster than previously. And thirdly, everyone is way more over leveraged. And of course, we have a much larger investment sector, which is already on the turn. So I think they are hopeful, but they really don't have any basis to say that prices will go higher from this point. Frankly, it's a misdirection. Hi, it's Liz Interruption, but if you're getting value from this post and have not done so, please consider subscribing to this channel or ring the bell for custom alerts. Plus, please consider supporting our efforts. You can make a one-off donation via PayPal, here's the link, or subscribe via Patreon for as little as $3 US a month or more to get access to exclusive additional content. Alternatively, you can also donate using Bitcoin. Here is the QR code. The links are in the comments below. I really appreciate your support, which enables us to continue to make more great content. Thanks very much. Now, back to the current show. And if you want further evidence of that, look at what Fitch said. Fitch Ratings affirmed Australia's long-term foreign currency issue a default rate at AAA, but revised the outlook to negative from stable. They said that the negative outlook reflects the significant impact the global coronavirus pandemic has had on Australia's economy and public finances. Growth will fall sharply in 2020 and government spending in response to the health and economic crisis will cause large fiscal deficits and a sharp increase in government debt. The AAA rating reflects the sovereign strong institutions and effective macroeconomic policy framework, which has supported a long record of stable economic growth into the current external shock. Fitch forecasts GDP to contract by 5% in 2020, driven by a plunge in economic activity due to virus containment measures. While those measures have effectively curbed the spread of the virus, they've also constrained household consumption and reduced business sentiment and investment. We expect a gradual economic recovery to begin in the second half of 2020 and forecast GDP to grow by 4.8% in 2021. 
Domestic restrictions are now being eased, but border controls are likely to remain in place for some time, constraining international tourism and student service exports. So risks are tilted to the downside given uncertainties around the spread of the virus domestically and globally. A resurgence of cases in Australia could lead to the reimposition of domestic restrictions and the global outlook could also be worse than we currently forecast if the emergence from current lockdown measures is slower than we anticipate or if there is a second wave of infections. Australia's exports would be particularly affected if China's recovery were to falter, and international and bilateral trade tensions with China also pose risks. The forecast GDP contraction will end a run of 28 years consecutive growth, and effective and flexible policy frameworks along with strong net migration have underpinned a record of stable economic growth in the face of considerable external financial and commodity price shocks. The authorities have launched substantial fiscal and monetary policy stimulus in response to the current stock, which should soften the shock and support the economic recovery. The government has announced three fiscal packages totaling 194 billion US dollars, about 10% of GDP. Of course, this was before the 60 billion change to the recent program. In direct spending over the last four years, heavily front loaded to cushion the impact of the coronavirus shock by providing income support to households and businesses. Central to these measures is the $130 billion JobKeeper scheme. Well, <laughs> 60 billion less now. Scheduled to expire in September, which provides wage subsidies to incentivize firms to retain their employees. In addition to the direct fiscal stimulus, the Commonwealth Government has allocated 20 billion Australian dollars in loan guarantees for SMEs and 15 billion dollars to Australia's Office of Financial Management to invest in structured finance products. States and territories have also announced fiscal stimulus measures of about 12 billion dollars or 0.6% of GDP through tax relief and cash payments. Fiscal deficits are set to swell at both the Commonwealth and state levels as a result of the discretionary fiscal measures and economic contraction. We forecast the general government deficit to rise to 6.9% of GDP in the fiscal year ending June 2020 and to 9% in financial year 21 from 1.2% in financial year 19. Higher expenditures are the key driver of the fiscal deterioration rising to about 44% of GDP in both financial year 20 and 21 from 37% in financial year 19. Revenues are forecast to decline as a share of GDP beginning in financial year 21 due to lagged effects of the weak economy and modestly lower iron ore prices. Fitch forecasts Australia's gross general government debt to jump to 58.2% of GDP by financial year 21 from 41.9% in financial year 19 on the back of the wider fiscal deficits. This stands well above the current Fitch forecast AAA median of 44% of GDP in 2021. Whereas for other advanced economies, most of Australia's fiscal support is on balance sheet, which drives a more severe decline in fiscal metrics, but limits contingent liabilities relating to loan guarantee programs. And beyond financial year 21, Fitch forecasts lower fiscal expenditures and narrower deficits, leading to a debt to GDP ratio of around 60% by the end of financial year 24. The authorities have demonstrated a recent commitment to fiscal prudence, but this comes in the context of a rise in the debt level from 21.9% of GDP, which fits upgraded Australia to AAA in 2011, and the Reserve Bank of Australia implemented sizable monetary stimulus to facilitate lending and financial market liquidity and functioning. In March, the ABA cut the policy rate twice by 25 basis points to 0.25% and announced a yield target of 0.25% for the three-year government bond. The RBA also implemented a $90 billion term funding facility, which provides banks with three-year funding at 0.25% to support lending to SMEs. Fitch does not expect a change to the policy rate through 2021, and inflation is forecast to remain well below the RBA's 2-3% target band, averaging 1.2% in 2020 and 21. Fitch expects the average unemployment rate to rise 
to 8% in 2020 from 5.2% in 2019 before gradually declining to 7.1% in 2021. The JobKeeper program will help to contain the potential spike in the unemployment rate from the coronavirus shock, but measures of underemployment, hours worked and participation will be affected more greatly. Household debt at 186.8% of disposable income in the fourth quarter 19 is among the highest of AAA rated sovereigns and poses an economic and financial stability risk in the event that the current shock proves more persistent or leads to a structurally weaker labour market. Households' ability to service their debt could become impaired, a six-month mortgage repayment holiday limits near-term risks, and many households have prepaid their mortgages or maintain offset accounts, which provides a buffer for debt servicing. And Australia's banking system, which scores A on Fitch's banking systems indicator, lowered from double A after the downgrade of four large banks in April 2020, is relatively well positioned to manage the current shock. And Fitch expects deterioration in bank assets, quality and earnings due to weak economic performance and lower interest rates. Capitalisation will be affected by weaker asset quality, but buffers remain sufficient at current bank rating levels and sound prudential regulation and the strengthening of our underwriting standards has improved the resilience of bank balance sheets and funding and liquidity is supported by the RBA's liquidity management and support measures limiting near-term pressures. Net external debt remains among the highest within the AAA category at 57.9% of GDP in 2019. However, they say we view Australia's exposure to potential external financing risks from a sharp shift in capital flows as relatively limited. Australian banks have generally relied on external funding, but were able to meet much of their external funding needs early in the year. And domestic liquidity support combined with strong deposit inflows and slower growing growth limits the need to access these markets in the near term. And banks have considerably reduced their reliance on external wholesale funding since the global financial crisis. And the RBA also established a swap line of 60 billion US dollars with the US Federal Reserve to relieve possible US dollar liquidity pressures. But the take up on the swap line since early May amounted to just 1 billion US dollars. And Australia posted a current account surplus of 0.6% of GDP in 2019, its first full year surplus since 1973, on the back of historically high terms of trade. Fitch forecasts a return to a slight deficit of 0.2% of GDP in 2020 and 0.7% in 2021 as the terms of trade recede from their recent highs. This is well below the deficit of 6.7% of GDP in 2007 before the global financial crisis. And once again, I say Fitch is looking at this through, I think, rather rose tinted specs. And of course, most rating agencies are a bit on the conservative side. I think the exposure to the banking sector is more significant, although they are right that through the RBA and via government policy, the banks are massively supported in Australia. So my own view is that financial stability is being supported by government and that provides a level of confidence about the future trajectory of at least the major banks. Now, over in the US, the Fed balance sheet grew again, but only lifted their balance sheet by 1.5% or 103 billion US dollars last week to a new high of 7.03 trillion US dollars, up 77% from the start of the COVID crisis or a cool 3.27 trillion dollars. I'm sure the bankers will be most grateful, but let's be clear, this is helicopter money for Wall Street. It has very little to do with the real economy. No surprise that US unemployment was up once again, continuing the trends of recent weeks. And we also got a look at the US property market. Existing home sales dropped in April, continuing what is now a two-month skid in sales brought on by the pandemic, according to the National Association of Realtors, America's largest trade association, representing more than 1.4 million members involved in all aspects of the residential and commercial real estate industries. Each of the four major regions experienced a decline in month-over-month -month sales and year-over-year -year sales, with the West seeing the greatest dip in both categories. Total existing home sales completed transactions that include single-family homes, townhouses, condominiums and co-ops dropped 17.8% from 2019 
from March to a seasonally adjusted annual rate of 4.33 million in April. Overall sales decreased year over year, down 17.2% from a year ago, and was 5.23 million in April 2019. The current lockdowns occurring from mid-March through April in most states have temporarily disrupted home sales. But the listings that are on the market are still attracting buyers and boosting home prices, they said. April's decline in existing home sales is the largest month-over-month -month drop since July 2010, down 22.5%. The median existing home price for all housing types in April was, and this is a shocker, $286,800, up 7.4% from April 2019. Did you hear that? $286,000, way lower than Australia. From April 2019 when it was $267,000 as prices increased in every region. April's national price increase marks 98 straight months of year-over-year -year gains. Record low mortgage rates are likely to remain in place for the rest of the year and will be the key factor driving housing demand as state economies steadily reopen, they said. Still more listings and increased home construction will be needed to tame price growth. And total housing inventory at the end of April was 1.47 million units, down 1.3% from March and down 19.7% from one year ago at 1.83 million. Unsold inventory sits at 4.1 month supply at the current sales pace, up from 3.4 months in March and down from the 4.2 month figure recorded in April 2019. Properties typically remained on the market for 27 days in April, seasonally down from 29 days in March, but up from 24 days in April 2019, and 56% of homes sold in April 2020 were on the market for less than a month. First time buyers were responsible for 36% of sales in April, up from 34% in March 2020 and 32% in April 2019. And NAR's 2019 profile of home buyers and settlers, released in late 2019, revealed that the annual share of first time buyers was 33%. Individual investors or second home buyers who accounted for many cash sales purchased 10% of homes in April, down from 13% in March and from 16% in April 2019. All cash sales accounted for 15% of transactions in April, down from 90% in March and 20% in April 2019. Distress sales, foreclosures and short sales represented 3% of sales in April, about even with both March 2020 and April 2019. All bad news for the nation's 1.4 million realtors. So you can see the massive disparity between prices for property in Australia and in the US. One reason again to underscore again that property in Australia is massively overpriced, is way too expensive and frankly not very affordable at all. This is a policy mistake that has been running for at least 20 years and now we're beginning to reap the whirlwind. And finally, in a conference call on Thursday, several hundred Deutsche Bank designated leaders were urged to take the voluntary pay cut to help share the pain as COVID-19 takes its toll, according to the Financial Times. Many of the managers asked to make the sacrifice are one level below the senior management committee, the nine members of the bank's management board, along with those on the group management committee, had already agreed to give up a month of their fixed pay. As our restructuring plans progress, the management board and the group management committee have decided to lead by example and give a broader group of senior managers the opportunity to be part of this initiative, Deutsche Bank said in a statement. I expect to see more banks looking to reduce staff remuneration as this crisis plays out. I wonder how many senior bankers in Australia will announce that they're going to take a pay cut. Watch this space. And more broadly, I think the property sector will be in for a tough time in Australia, even as the lockdowns are released a little. It all stems from household confidence and household willingness to transact. Both are pretty weak at the moment. And with unemployment set to be 7% or more during the next year or two, if things go well, I still maintain my negative outlook on property. And as I said in a tweet today, if one household defaults, it's their problem. 
If 10,000 default, it's the bank's problem. But if 500,000 default, it's the country's problem. And I think they will do anything to try and stop defaults. But at some time, the piper must be paid, just, they hope, after the next election. And so fundamentally, property prices becomes a political issue, not just an economic one. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.